Um, it's Wednesday night. This is the core of the church. Tanya and I were talking about this Sunday morning at, at Sunday school. We were talking about how Wednesday night is the core. If you are here on Wednesday nights, you are the core of this church. And this is the very people that should be swinging from the rafters. I'm just getting real with you. I mean, on Sunday mornings, this house is almost, I mean, it's, there's a lot of people in here, April. And there's a lot of praise in the Lord going on. And that's wonderful. I'm not discounting that at all. But this is the core of the house of God if you're here on Wednesday nights. And on Wednesday nights, we should be the holy rollers. Because if we're the core of this church, Brother Ed, we should be jumping up and down, praising God every chance we get. And I, that's just my opinion. And that's the way I feel about this Wednesday night crew. So when I was, David and I were talking about this, he said, um, I really think you need to say something. And I was like, well, I don't really have anything. And, and I, I kind of had something, but I, I ventured off of it. And I, y'all know I read in the Old Testament a lot, but I've been reading in Romans. And so I thought, well, maybe that's where God wants me to go. And sure enough, I started reading in Romans, Jason, and it took me to Jeremiah and took me right back to Judges. I just cannot, for some reason, get out of that book right now. And so that's where we're going to go tonight, Judges chapter 9. If you want to flip there, go ahead. I get out of that book, and then I come back to that book, and I get out of it, and I come back. And Judges chapter 9 particularly, um, I'm going to talk to you about, like I said, about using what you have in the battle. And let me give you just a little bit of history here about what was going on in this, in, in this part of the history of Israel. Um, Gideon has died, okay, and Gideon did a wonderful thing. Gideon had many sons. One of his sons by one of his maidservants, and this is a sermon for another day, but this, this kid, Abimelech, was not even a legitimate son of Gideon's. He was a son of a maidservant. And in chapter 9, he goes and talks to the men of, of a little town called Shechem. And he talks the men into kind of deeming him prince over Israel. And so what Abimelech does is he goes and he kills all of his 70 brothers. Okay? And he gets the men of Shechem behind him. And he is what my Amplified Bible calls a wicked usurper. And we're going to come back and talk about that. Because in my mind, when I was reading this, I want you to think when you read about Abimelech as if it's Satan. Because a wicked usurper is Satan. That's the devil. And a usurper just means someone who wrongfully or illegally tries to take the place of another. Well, we know that's exactly what Satan does. He tries to counterfeit everything that Jesus Christ does. We know that. So when we're going to read about Abimelech, I want you to think in your mind and equate that to Satan. We're going to start in Judges chapter 9, verse 50. And it says, Then Abimelech went to Thebes, or Thebes, and encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower in the city, and all the people of the city, men and women, fled to it, shut themselves in it, and went to the roof of the tower. And Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire. But a certain woman cast an upper millstone down upon Abimelech's head and broke his skull. Then he hastily called to the young man, his armor bearer, that was the person that carried his things around for him, and said to him, draw your sword and slay me, so that men may not say of me, a woman slew me. And his young man thrust him through, and he died. And when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, they departed each man to his home. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father Gideon, by slaying his seventy brothers. And all of the wickedness of the men of Shechem God repaid upon their heads, and caused to come upon them the curse of Jotham, son of Jerobel. Jerobel is just another word for Gideon. That was the same person. So what has happened here is after Abimelech caused the people of Shechem to deem him prince, which that was illegal, he was a usurper, it wasn't right, it shouldn't have been done that way, he uh, goes to the town of Shechem, he turns on them, because of course they begin to have, have it out, and he turns on them. And if you go up a few verses in that chapter, you'll see that the people of Shechem went to a strong tower, and they tried to hide in that tower. But Abimelech burned it to the ground, and he burned all the people up. And my Bible says it was about a thousand men and women that he burned up in this tower of Shechem. 
And what struck me about this passage of Scripture particularly is a couple of things. One, how was it that the people of Shechem died and the people of Thebes lived? And so I began to ask God, God, what's the difference between these two? Because in my historical reflection upon these two cities, they're anywhere between 6 and 11 miles apart. They're right there close together. Some might say it's like Poet and Prattsville. They're pretty close together. And I thought, why, God, did you spare one city and not the other? And he, he reminded me about looking at the hearts of the people. It was the men of Shechem that turned against Gideon's siblings. Their hearts were wrong. They turned and they anointed or basically allowed Abimelech to call himself a prince when he wasn't. The people of Thebes didn't do that. And what, what I settled on when I was studying this for myself um, was that there was one woman who found refuge in the strong tower. And you could camp right here for just a little bit. And you could talk about probably this woman's heart. But you, you could also talk about the symbolism behind the tower. Because how many times in the book of Psalms, Woody, or Proverbs, does it say that he is our strong tower? He's our fortified refuge. He's where we go when the, enemy, when the battle is blazing and the enemy is near. Where do you go, Phyllis? I'll tell you where I go. I don't have any other place to go but him. Because sometimes there are things that I can't talk to anybody about, not even my husband. And he's the only one that I can talk to about it. He should be our strong tower. And for me, when I read this, the symbolism was just, it just reached out and slapped me, kind of. You know? Because I got to thinking, Vic, the people of Thebes, one, their hearts were right. They were different from the people of Shechem. They had the same enemy at their doorstep, but their hearts were in a different place. And so when they went to their strong tower, God gave them a weapon, Alicia, that they used every single day with a woman that remains unnamed to this day in the Bible. You see, I'm going to move now. We're going to transition. I want to talk to you about this little woman. There are many times in the Bible that the Bible will reference a person and not name them, you know, or they will reference a person that did something great and name them. For instance, in Judges chapter 4, where Deborah uh, is in the battle with Barak, there's a little woman named Jael, and she drives a tent peg through a man's head, and the Bible talks about her. She did one little thing, a huge thing, really, but one little reference. And I wondered, why, God, why was this little woman not named? Because it seems that her defeat of the enemy was just as great as Jael's. And it doesn't really matter why she, why she wasn't named, but, but I stuck with her for just a little bit, and I wanted to, to learn about what, what the big deal was, God. Why did you put this in the Bible that a woman cast a millstone down from a strong tower and defeated the enemy? And so I began to dig just a little bit about a millstone. And you see, Alicia, I had no idea. I just thought it was a rock. Um, and in my mind, I kind of had a vision of a rock. And I thought, well, how big of a rock was a millstone? And so I began to do just a little bit of digging, Jason, yeah. And I learned that there are two levels of millstones, or there were two levels of millstones. There was a, what they called a lower level, and there was an upper level. And on the lower level, Woody, it would have been so big that it may have taken a couple of men to pull it, or a donkey or two, is what, what my uh, historical um, documents were saying. But the upper millstone, Jay, would have been one that she could have just grabbed in the heat of knowing that, that the devil was coming, she could have just grabbed it and said, I'm going to the tower with everybody else. And she got up there. And when he, and, and the word of God says that he neared the door. Let me find that real quick. It says when he neared the door of the tower, he came near the door of the tower to burn it with fire in verse 52 is what it says. And when that happened, it says a certain woman cast an upper millstone down upon Abimelech's head. You see, she took something with her that God had equipped her with that she had been working with all along. Because every day, my understanding is, Dave, is that these little women ground this barley and this wheat and whatever else they had, and the flour would drop out beneath it. It was cone-shaped, Vic. It was cone-shaped. And, and when they would grind it, the flour would drop down underneath it. And so she took this rock that she would grind with she used every day, and there's no telling how many times that little woman had picked that rock up and worked with it and used it, and she took it with her to this tower, and as the enemy approached, 
She, she used what God had equipped her with. And how many, I, I, how many times do we think we don't have any, we're not equipped with anything? I think that about myself. I think, God, I'm not equipped. I can't do this. I don't know. I don't have anything that you can use. Has anybody else in this house ever thought that? I've thought that. And when I say that to David, David goes, oh, you're crazy. You've got plenty that, that he can use. But I feel that way. I think, God, what, what have I got that you can use? I mean, I've got a mouth, yeah, but there's lots of people that have got a mouth. So when, when I really began to study this and realize that she was willing to use what she had been working with every day, Brother Ray, what she was familiar with, what God had equipped her with, and that was that stone. And what may be so simple, Ed, to some people as a, as a millstone just to grind flour, she handled it frequently and regularly. And when the enemy approached them in that tower, she did what she knew. And she grabbed that thing like she always has, and she chunked it down, and she defeated the enemy with something she used every single day. That may mean absolutely nothing to all of you. And this whole, everything that's coming out of my mouth may be something just for me. But that touched me. That spoke to me when I realized that, that what God had given her and equipped her to use was something she had used and handled every single day. How many of us look at other things and think, oh, if I could just do that, if I could just sing like Tanya, if I could just, if I was just good with the kids like Vicky, if I could cook like Alicia, Lord, how many of us do that? I do that. I, I do. And I thank God, forgive me for doing that, for ever having done that, because I want to use what you have equipped me with. And this body, this group right here, this core of this church, we need to be ready to use what God has equipped us with. You, I'm going to deviate here just a little bit, and I'm going to talk about this tower because I've talked to you about her. But there's a significance of elevating yourself in a tower. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but um, I want you to think with me. I know the Google told me <laughs> earlier this afternoon when I just logged on to the Google. It, I just Googled Strong Tower, biblical reference. And I bet tw a dozen of them come up, Brother Red. And it was Psalms and Proverbs and Psalms and Proverbs, which, that makes sense. And so I began to think, God, why in a tower? Shechem, they all died in a tower. The Bez, they all lived. Think about the visual perspective of a tower. When you're elevated, you're up over something. If you've got enough weaponry in the tower, you can sit there and cast stuff down all day long at the devil when he hits you. It's not like you're not on the same level with him. You see what I'm saying? And when God began to show me that, I was like, Lord Jesus, okay, I think I see that. I see the point of going up into the tower. Now, let me say this to you. For weeks, I have, I have just kind of been in, I don't know, I've hurt myself several times. Y'all know I totaled my car. It's just been one of those things. It's just felt like it was one thing after another. But probably a month and a half ago, I started reading Jason Beard in Psalms 91 and 1. And I just kept reading Ed that verse over and over and over again. And I've told Jackie this. I was stuck on it. And that verse says that he who abides in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed in the shadow of the Almighty. And on down in Psalms 91, it talks about how that if you will abide in the secret place of the Most High, that the angels will lift you up, and you will not even cast your foot on a stone, Ed. You won't hurt yourself. And I began to think, I, literally, I've hurt my feet since vacation probably six times. And so I started going, God, I need some of those angels. Because I am hurting myself. I mean, I literally, I took the power washer and I scraped the hide off of my right foot. I'm not joking. Barefooted. Well, no. Let me go back to vacation. Let me start with this. We were at Panama City on the way back and I had the white, bright idea to take a metal lounger and set it down in the waves. Well, I was barefooted and it was late and I wasn't paying attention to the waves. And I set that sucker down in those waves and it pushed that metal chair right into my foot and skimmed skin off both of my feet. Not just one of them, but both of them. I couldn't wear tennis shoes for the whole rest of vacation. And I got home. We decided to power wash the house. 
I'm outside in flip-flops. I know I shouldn't be, but I like flip-flops in the summertime. I was power washing the house barefooted. I've got a rug on the patio. I re reached down to pick it up. I had the power washer going because it was too hard for me to try to turn it on and off, so I had it still going. I took that power washer in and scraped the hide off my right foot. This is no joke. Last week, we're out with the goats. I know y'all are thinking this is funny. I'm out there in flip-flops, messing around by the barn. I slip off one of the flip-flops. There is a huge, round, rusty, nasty thing of barbed wire, and I stepped right on it. And I was like, oh, I probably need a tetanus shot. I was expecting luck, y'all. <laughs> Literally, I was. I was thinking, I, don't, I know I've not had a tetanus shot in 10 years. I don't really think that it got into the bloodstream. I think it just broke the skin enough to bleed. So here I was in my mind trying to rationalize, did it make it into the bloodstream or not? Am, am I, is it safe or not? Literally. I mean, just gashed it up. And I was like, oh, well, I'm just going to deal with it. If I get locked off, we'll know why. I was in the house then, a couple days later, barefooted. You know, the bottom, what do you call the bottom part of your stove where you store stuff? Alicia, what do you call that? You know, the little thing where you pull it out and it's got like your, yeah, yeah. Well, I was standing there and I jerked the thing out and it was hung and I couldn't get it to come out. And so I jerked it really hard, just banged the side of my foot. And so for weeks, actually, the time that I hit it with the power washer is when I began to realize, I was like, God, what's going on with my feet? And then I did the barbed wire right after that. I hurt myself, and I was like, okay, Lord, what's going on with my feet? I keep hurting my feet. And then I hit my foot with the stove. And so I began to speak. I said, I've been speaking for weeks, long before I started hurting myself. Psalms 91 and 1, that he who abides in the secret place, or in the uh, secret place of the Most High, shall remain stable and fixed in the shadow of the Almighty. I said, Lord, on down in that chapter, you said you would have angels pick me up. So I need some help, obviously. I'm having some trouble walking around. I need some angels to pick me up because this hurts. And I've realized something in consideration of that verse of Scripture in Psalms 91, that if you abide in the strong tower, your vision is different. You can see the attacks of the enemy. You see what I'm saying? Because if you're eye level with him, sometimes you can't see him coming for all the other people that you're eye level with for all the other things that you're eye level with. But if you're up in this tower, if you're up in the top of the tower, April, and that's where I wanna go, I don't wanna just be in the bottom of his tower, I wanna be in the top. I wanna be in the top where I can see and he can equip me with something I have used every day. I wanna be in the top of that tower so that I can see when Satan comes at me and wants to burn that thing out from underneath me. I can recognize because he promised me in Psalms 91 that I would remain stable and fixed if I stay in the secret place. And if we're in that strong tower, you will recognize when the enemy is there. And he will equip us, Alicia, with the things we use every day to do battle with him. And that's really, what, that's really all I had tonight because this was something I've struggled with. And I was like, God... I'll talk about whatever. I don't know what you want me to talk about. That's my, that's my worst fear is David or pastor or somebody asking me to speak and me really feeling like I didn't have anything because I'll say no. But then David said, no, I think you do have something. And, and I did. I just had to go back and kind of reopen it up for myself. But it was good. And he reminded me that if you're feeling this way, there are other people that are feeling this way. And that's something else I forget, Ed. I think I'm the Lone Ranger. You know, Candy and I were talking about that the other day. We were talking about how easy it is to forget that we all have like feelings. We all feel unworthy and not usable and like we don't measure up. It doesn't matter what our gifts are. We all feel that way at some point or another. Or if you don't, you may have an issue with your pride, and that's for another night. <laughs> uh, you know? That's right. That's right. That's right. When we see those things happening, we need to take action and don't just allow him to go ahead and do That's exactly right. You know, there are people out in the world who won't come to the tower. 
And think about what would have happened to her, Tanya, if she'd have just stayed in her house. Abimelech would have killed her and everybody around her. The point of the saving was that the people ran to the tower. How many, if she hadn't have ran to the tower, she would have died. I'm just guessing. I mean, he had killed everybody in Shechem. He was coming to get them. And so people have got to be willing and recognize their need for the tower, you know, for the, for the change of view that the tower can give you. That could preach right there. For, for, it changes your perspective to be with the Lord and to be in that secret place because you see the attacks of Satan differently. And you almost see them, I think, you know, some people say, I, I just got blindsided. I just don't know where that came from, and I've heard that. And, you know, we've all probably could think of examples of people who just seem to constantly get blindsided by something. And I understand stuff happens. But I just want to say to them, run to the tower. If you will abide in that secret place, in that strong tower, it will change the way you look at things. It will change your total perspective. And that's really um, all I wanted to say tonight. I kind of thought to end this that we might have a time of, uh, of prayer. Um, you know, the Word of God, He says that His house will be a house of prayer. And I realized that um, we have a prayer meeting on Tuesday nights, um, but I really felt like tonight with this core group that that's something that we need to do because I know that it's sometimes impossible for all of this core group to get here on Tuesday nights. So I thought we might do it for a little while tonight, and then we'll just consider ourselves dismissed after that. So, Fred, um, if, if no one else has anything, and I'm opening it up right now, if nobody else has anything, then, Fred, I'm going to ask you and Dan to put on something soft, and that we'll just take a little bit and come around the altars if you want, or stay at your chair and you want, or if you want, however you want to do it, and we'll just take a little time to be with the Lord, and then consider yourselves dismissed.
Sins are so many More than you can bear Take a look around you Know that you're inside Shelter of Almighty Problems can Not remain now that you have entered to his vast domain. So press a little deeper beyond the inner gain. The mercy seats exposed to all the glory cloud.
you know, as as you guys are still in the altar and people are cutting out, just kind of wanted to say something before everybody just took totally took off. Um, I want to leave this week with this thought of, you know, God's got a time clock, and I hope there's still people in the gatheria that's listening. He's got a time clock that once you get past this certain stage in the game, um, there's no turning back. You know, and I don't know, nobody knows that clock. No man knows the hour, he knows. But I want you to leave this week with this thought as you come to church Sunday. And for the rest of every Sunday, from near, for this local body here specifically, how many people would it take for God to send an extra measure of the Holy Spirit or extra measure of grace or power in these last days to advance His kingdom? How many hearts, how many people would it take dedicated to want to see His work done to where he just puts the brakes on things and says, hey, I'm going to slow down the, the crisis in the Middle East. I'm going to slow down the collapse of the American economy. I'm going to slow down this, that, or the other because there's a church over here that's got an understanding of who I am and, and what I want to do. He would do it. He would do it if just one church, one person, one group of people, a remnant decide, hey, Let's make a difference in this last hour because if we do that, if we become those people, then those are more people that come to the kingdom. If we don't do anything, the, the world's just going to run rampant and it's going to hasten the clock. So I want you to understand that you could be that person. Your heart could be that heart. Your mind could be that mind. This church could be that church that God says, I'm going to put everything on hold in the world because they're trying to do something in my name down there. They're trying to do something. And last thing, and then we're, you know, we leave. I've always said, and what I've believed to this day, what I want is I want God to be happy that he made me. I want him to be happy that he made me. I want to be worthy of him creating me. And I never want to lose that. I want him to go, John, Dave, I'm so happy I made you. You did it. You stuck it out. You, you guys started a revival in Poe in Arkansas and it spread. I want, I want to be a key ingredient in something. I want him to be happy that he made me. Not become disgusted like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, like he did in Genesis chapter 6. I want him to be happy. So you're, you're that important to God. You're the key. You're one of the tumblers on the key. You're that important. Your heart and your mind, dedicated and, and, and broken and contrite and saying, I'm going to make a difference and we all do that together. It starts the ball rolling. You matter that much. You're that special. I think you would stop the universe for you, Tanya. He'd stop the universe for you, Jason, as long as we hadn't passed that clock. Why? Because you might win one more. You might win 10 more. He would hold off as long as we're willing to work. And we got to be willing to work. So that mindset comes Sunday, willing just to throw down all your chains and work. Anybody got anything to say? We're going to close. All hearts are good. Well, let's pray and we'll, we'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, God, I come to you in the name of Jesus, Lord. I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for everything you are and everything you do for us, Father. God, I, I make no argument that I look forward to the day that I leave this earth. I make no argument that I look forward to the day that I step into eternity with you. But, Father, as long as I'm here, God, give me the strength. Give us the strength, God, for this life it wears on you. It wears you out. It makes you tired. It gets your mind off the focus of the kingdom. It gets your mind off the focus of you. It gets your mind off the focus of our heart having to be broken before you. But God, I'm asking for measure of grace and mercy and, and strength, God, to keep us focused. That God, you, you're, all, you all, you're all that matters. We're all going to go to heaven. We, everybody here, I believe, is saved. And God, if that's the case, then we're all going to heaven. So we might as well fight to the bitter end. God, give us the strength to do so. And in the same breath, come, Lord Jesus, come. 
In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.